understand. The first scene is the Last Supper. Um, everybody's familiar with the story of the Last Supper. If you haven't read it, you've seen a painting about it. I think somebody painted a picture one time, right, about the Last Supper. Um, and so we're all familiar with, with that happening uh, in Matthew chapter 26. But let me give you the setting of what took place at the Last Supper. We find Jesus with his 12 apostles. Uh, those apostles are named in the Bible, Simon Peter, a uh, man by the name of Andrew. There was James and John. Uh, there was Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, a guy named Thaddeus, uh, a guy named Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. How many of you are impressed that I could recite that? Nobody. I didn't recite it. I read it. But anyway, I had to memorize that those names in Bible college, and like everything else, I still don't remember the names. But anyway, we have the 12 disciples uh, seated around the table at the, at the Last Supper. And, and Jesus at the Last Supper, the Last Supper, by the way, was also the Passover. So we often think of the Last Supper uh, in, in reference to the Lord's Supper that we observe as New Testament Christians when we, we eat the unleavened bread and we drink the unfermented wine and we partake uh, in what we call the Lord's Supper as New Testament believers. But the Lord's Supper actually originated when Jesus observed the last final Passover supper he'd ever eat with his disciples, and that's what's recorded in Matthew chapter 26. Now, at this Last Supper, this final supper that Jesus was enjoying uh, with his disciples, he begins to explain to them that this religious ceremony known as the Passover, which, by the way, uh, as Jews, these men have observed all of their lives, right? They've been observing the Passover all of their lives, and now Jesus sits them down, and he begins to explain to them that this, this religious ritual that they went through, this, this Passover, this feast that they observed as Jews from the time they were children. They cannot remember a time when they didn't observe the Passover. Jesus, but Jesus begins explaining to them that, that this feast, this Passover is really just a picture. It's a foreshadow. It's a prophetic vision of the fact that one day the Messiah was going to come and he was going to become our sacrificial lamb and die in our place. So Jesus is taking the bread of the Passover and he says, listen, this bread is my body. It's a picture of my body. It's unleavened because I'm not sinful. I've never sinned. I've lived 33 and a half years with, uh, with my people that I've created, and I've never one time sinned. I've never broken my own law. In other words, Jesus says this bread that's unleavened is a picture of the fact that I'm unleavened. I'm sinless. And yet being the sinless Lamb of God, I'm going to be broken. My body's going to be beaten. I am going to go to a cross. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die for you. So this Passover, this feast that you have observed since you were children, was really just a picture of what you're seeing in front of you. It was a picture of me. And he says, so take, eat. this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he begins to pass out the wine. And he says, this wine is a picture of my blood that's going to be spilled. I'm going to shed my blood on a cross for you. And so the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reveal to us some pivotal events that took place at the Last Supper. It was at this Last Supper where Jesus poured water into a basin. What we just sung about a moment ago, He washed my feet. Jesus poured water into a basin, a bowl, and, and, he, and he tied a, a, a towel around His waist. And the Bible says He did the unthinkable. Now, if we believe the Bible, we understand that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We understand that John's Gospel, chapter 1, says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him there was not anything made that was made. So we see Jesus as Creator God. We see Jesus as Emmanuel. We see Jesus as God in the flesh. And now at the Last Supper, we see Jesus with a towel wrapped around His waist like a servant and a basin of water going one by one to those 12 disciples and kneeling in front of them and washing the filth from their feet. Amen. All 12 disciples, Jesus made a point to go to them one by one in compassion and in personal intimacy, wash their feet. 
This is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter number 2 when he says, Who being in the form of God thought it not right or be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus who could have commanded adoration. Jesus who could have commanded praise. Jesus who could have commanded servitude became a servant Amen. to His disciples, including Judas Iscariot. Amen. He washed the disciples' feet at the last supper. It was at this final meeting with His disciples that Jesus revealed the fact that there had always been an imposter in their midst. I want to explain something to you today. Judas didn't join Jesus' church without Jesus knowing the true nature and character of the person that he allowed to join his band of 12 men. Amen. Now watch this. In chapter 20 or chapter 26, verse 21, it says, And as they did eat, he said, Verily or truly I say unto you that one of you will betray me. He said, I'm telling you, one of you is an imposter. One of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to turn your back on me. And the fact of the matter is, Judas already had before we got to Matthew 26. Now we're going to come back to that thought, but it's important for us to hang that picture in the corridor of our mind that Judas Iscariot, Jesus knew who he was. He says later on, he said that Judas was a devil from the beginning. The Bible calls him the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction, son of condemnation, son of damnation. He called Judas the son of destruction. And he knew from the beginning that Judas would turn his back on him. That Judas would stab him in the back. I don't know anything. There are things lower, but I can't name too many things that are much lower than somebody that would stab a friend in the back the way Judas did Jesus. Amen. And at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I know one of you is an imposter. And so, first picture that you need to have in your mind is this setting at the Last Supper. Then, from the Last Supper, as the Last Supper was being concluded, the Bible tells us uh, that in verse twenty or verse number thirty, rather, that they sung a hymn. They sang a song. It was probably a casting crown song. We can't say for sure, but they sang a song, and they went out unto the Mount of Olives. Now, of all things, we know what instruments they didn't have. They didn't have a piano or an organ that day, that night. Amen. Some people think pianos and organs are the only acceptable instruments in the church. They didn't have a piano or an organ because, well, that should go without saying. Amen? Amen. You ever try to tow the piano or an organ around? They're not very mobile. But they sung a hymn, and had nothing to do with what I'm preaching today, just like the gouge every now and then. Amen? But they sung a hymn, they sung a song, and then it says they went to the Mount of Olives. Now, we don't know the exact location of the of the Last Supper. We don't know exactly where that upper room was that was furnished where they observed the final Passover with Jesus. But we do know where the Mount of Olives is. And I've been there on more than one occasion. I've stood on the Mount of Olives on three different occasions. And it, it, it's, a, it's a location uh, just to the east of the, of the old walls of Jerusalem. In fact, when you stand on the hillside, of the Mount of Olives. It's a beautiful panoramic picture. For those of you who are friends with me on Facebook, when I was in Israel in December, I stood on the Mount of Olives and took that panoramic, you know, you can do on the iPhone if you got a smartphone, amen. Uh, my, my phone's smarter than I am because I don't know how to operate most of the time, but I figured out how to do that panoramic shot. I stood on the Mount of Olives and I took a panoramic view of, of, the, of the walls of Jerusalem where the, there was just really too much Bible prophecy that took place there to even mention in one place. But, but there's the eastern gate right there. By the way, the eastern gate, the Bible tells us in, in the book of Psalms, chapter number 24, that one day when Jesus returns to the earth, he's going to ride through the eastern gate. Now here's what's funny about that. The Muslims put a cemetery in front of the eastern gate, and then they blocked it up with concrete. Because the Muslims know that a true Jew will not walk over a cemetery. It, was, it would go against Jewish tradition to touch dead things. Amen. Right? So they said, what are we going to do to keep the Messiah from coming? Well, well, we'll put a cemetery right in front of the eastern gate, and then we'll block up the wall, right? What they fail to recognize is the Bible says that when Jesus comes again, the dead are going to rise first. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
And in Psalm 24, the Bible records a conversation between the right side of the eastern gate and the left side of the eastern gate. And the right side says to the left side, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, for the King of glory shall come in. And so when Jesus comes again, the right side of the gate is going to say to the left side, Don't we know Him? We better get out of the way. Because He's riding through here on a fury. And He's going to ride through that eastern gate. He's going to ride through that little valley. And that's the place that Jesus took His disciples. Because He was reminding them that in the Old Testament He was God. In their present time He was God. And in a prophetic sense, he was God who was coming back again. He said, listen, boys, I don't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm dying, but I'm coming back. Yeah. And he took them to the Mount of Olives and began to share things with them, intimate things about what he would suffer and why he would suffer. And they ended up in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, once again, sits right at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. You can still go there today. In fact, you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane and you will find there 2,000 year old olive trees. It's amazing. 2,000 years old. So when you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, you might be standing next to the very tree that Jesus prayed by. He took them there. The Bible says it was his custom to resort there for prayer. And he went there often and he prayed. But this time when Jesus prayed, he went there with his disciples minus one. Because Judas had already set out to betray the Son of God. And, and, but the eleven disciples and Jesus came to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane where we're told that Jesus began displaying an overwhelming sense of agony. Now, if you read the Gospels, Jesus doesn't get all that emotional very often, especially in a negative way, Right? We see him smiling, we see him laughing. Anybody who thinks it's not okay for Christians to smile and laugh and have a good time don't know Jesus very well. Because Jesus was a very kind-hearted, kind spirit. And as I said last week, Jesus was never mean to anybody but religious people. He was nice to drunks. He was nice to people that he didn't necessarily agree with their lifestyle, but he was still compassionate toward them. He still cared for them. And he still hung out with them, by the way. Jesus was kind, hearted, compassionate, but now the disciples see Jesus and his, 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 his visage, his appearance has been cast down and they look at Jesus now and instead of a smile on his face, they see a tear in his eye. And the Bible says Jesus begins displaying uh, this sense of agony and anguish of heart and mind and body. And, and he asks his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, if they would just accompany him and walk with him a short distance ahead of the other disciples while Jesus separated himself to pray. And here's what the Bible says. As he walked on with Peter and James and John, it says he went on a little farther. And then it says he fell on his face and began to intensely cry. And here was his cry. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he arose and he checked on his disciples and they were asleep like good Christians do. He went back and he prayed again. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will. I want your will, Father. He got up again, checked on his disciples. They were asleep and he woke them up and said, could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? He went back to his place of prayer and once again, he said, Father, if it's possible, if there's any way, uh, would you please let this cup pass for me? Nevertheless, I, I don't want my own will, God, I want your will. Because even God himself in the flesh submitted himself to the higher power of the Father. And he said, I know why I'm here. And I know this is the purpose for my coming. And, and, and I've heard preachers try to explain why Jesus prayed for the cup to pass and what the cup must have meant and what it must have represented. And I've heard people say, well, that cup represented the suffering that he was going to endure. And I've heard people say the cup represented the cross and the cup represented all these things. I, none of us can be 100% right 100% of the time. But here's what I believe that means. I believe that cup was a cup of our sin. Amen. 
Because the Bible says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It's not 100% accurate to say that Jesus took upon Himself our sins, although He did do that. And the Bible does reference the fact that He took upon Himself our sins. But literally the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. Literally when the Father pressed the cup, of our transgressions and our failures and our brokenness to the lips of the Son, Jesus said, It's nasty, but I'll drink it if I have to, to be close to them. It's painful, Father, but if I have to do the pain, if I have to go through this, if I have to become something that I'm not, to win the drug addict and to heal the broken if I have to become something that I'm not. If, if me being sinless, if me being perfect means I have to become imperfect and I have to die as a sacrifice in their place, then let me do it. Not my will, but your will be done. And at the conclusion of this season of prayer, Jesus stood there in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. As a company of soldiers with torches entered the scene, being led by a familiar face. That band of soldiers was being led by none other than the infamous Judas Iscariot. And Judas, one of the twelve disciples who followed Jesus during his earthly ministry, had sold the Savior out for thirty silver coins. And in verse 47, read with me uh, once again, it says this, While he yet spake, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staffs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. I want you to think about something for just a moment. In John chapter 10, verse number 7, Jesus said, I am the door. I am the door. Think about it. Judas literally kissed the door of heaven on the road to hell. How can anybody be so close, so close that his lips Touched the threshold of forgiveness. So close that, that his lips touched the doorway of hope. So close that he touched the corridor of eternal life. But then died in emptiness and died in condemnation. Even though he was so close to Jesus that he literally kissed him. Now, the Bible tells us that when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. That he prayed in such anguish that his sweat became as it were great drops of blood. The book of Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. The Bible says that through the blood of Jesus you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified Amen. from your sins. So if we could be a little bit more specific and intricate this morning, not only did Judas kiss the door of heaven on the road to hell, but the blood that could have cleansed him was on his lips because Jesus' sweat became great drops of blood. How can anybody be that close and still miss it? How can anybody come, not just within arm's reach, but literally touching the Messiah, literally touching Jesus, and still die and go to hell? Judas is a peculiar character in the Bible, is he not? Yeah. He was the treasurer of the church that Jesus pastored. They trusted him with the money. If we were to line up the 12 disciples, I listed them off to you a little while ago. Simon Peter, James, John, uh, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, we see Bartholomew and Matthew and, and all those disciples. If we lined up all 12 disciples in the front of this church and they stood in front of you for the next hour and you examined them and you scrutinized them, there is not one person in this room that could purposefully pick out Judas Iscariot from the other 12, from the other 11. No way. Couldn't do it. You might get lucky and guess, but you would never make an educated, definitive choice that that was Judas Iscariot if you didn't know him personally. 
Because he looked like all the other disciples. He went to the same church. He was on staff at the church. When the disciples went out preaching, Judas preached. Judas did the same thing that the other disciples did. They witnessed that he witnessed the same miracles that John witnessed. He witnessed when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He watched as he cleansed the leper. He saw Jesus open blind eyes. He saw Jesus open deaf ears. He watched as Jesus wrought miracle after miracle after miracle. And yet when Judas died, he died and went straight to a Christless eternity. So what was the difference? How was he so close and yet so far? The McCamies, uh, that group that sang at the, the fair just a, a month or so ago, the McCamies used to sing a song called Close to the Cross but Far from the Blood. Judas was so close, and yet he never experienced real forgiveness. You know, it's staggering in my mind to wonder how many people go to church and play church and do churchy stuff. But they don't really know what it is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because your religion will not save you. Amen. You can be a member of a church. You can be a Sunday school teacher, a children's church director. You can be a pastor, a preacher, a missionary, a deacon, a deacon's wife, a treasurer. It doesn't matter what you do. It's not about all that you do. It's not about heaping up about worth and, 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 and abilities and talents. It's not about all that you can produce. It's about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross that makes a difference. And a religion won't do it, but a relationship with Him will. Amen. And so I want to give you three simple thoughts this morning about Judas Iscariot, just some things that I've identified in studying his life because he, he bothers me. And he ought to bother you. It ought to bother every one of us that somebody can be in a church of 12 people with Jesus as the pastor and still go to hell. Amen. You hear me? Amen. We got more than 12 people in some pews this morning. Amen. His whole church consisted of 12 people and one of them was lost. So I want to share three simple things. Why Judas wasn't saved. How Judas missed it. And then we'll conclude this thought this morning. Number one, I want to say to you that Judas was a religious hypocrite. Now, I don't throw the word hypocrite around very loosely because it's used so loosely nowadays. Right? Everybody uses the word hypocrite to dismiss Christianity. Well, I'm not a Christian because all Christians are hypocrites. Right? I'm a church, church full of hypocrites. Look, so I don't use that word loosely. Amen? Get used to hypocrites. They're everywhere. Amen. But I'm telling you, by very definition, Judas was a religious hypocrite. Hypocrite. He no more knew God. Listen, he literally looked God in the face and didn't know who he was. Right? You say, well, why did Judas follow Jesus? Well, there were several reasons, but without going through all of them, for one thing I want to say, I believe Judas really thought that the Messiah was going to come and overthrow the Roman government. So far in his mind, it was a good political play to be part of this new movement, Right? Because they believed that when this Messiah would come, he was going to overthrow Caesar. But little did he know that that night when Jesus sat the disciples down and said, I didn't come to be a king on the throne. I came to die as a sacrifice on the cross. Judas said, I didn't sign up for that. Huh? So he had all kinds of ulterior motives. But let me show you some things. That, some of that's speculative, right? So let me give you some things that we know for certain based on what the Bible reveals about us. For one thing I can tell you this. Jesus and Judas never had an amiable conversation. That's recorded in the scripture. The only time you see Jesus and Judas conversing, Jesus, Jesus is rebuking him. And let me give you an example of that. In John chapter number 12, uh, the Bible records an incident where Jesus and the disciples were in Bethany. They had good friends there. Uh, one guy's name was Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus brought him up out of the grave and gave him life again. And so they became pretty good buddies, right? If somebody raises you from death, I'd hang on to that friend. <laughs> and so Jesus and Lazarus became good friends. Mary and Martha, uh, Lazarus' sisters, uh, were great servants of God. And so Jesus and the disciples would often resort to Bethany to spend time with this dear family that they loved so well. And, and as they were sitting there in John chapter 12, it seems like, and, and maybe you've had this happen to you at some point, have you ever just been in church and all of a sudden you got a case of, of what the old timers used to call the can't help it? When you just feel God and His presence is so real in your heart that you don't care who's sitting by you, you're just going to have a spell. Amen. Amen? 
You just going to go to worship man and the tears start flowing and you don't even listen. You're raising your hand you don't even have a question and maybe you're just getting happy in Jesus. Well, that happened to Mary that day. She'd been with Jesus many times before and they'd been to church and listened to Jesus teach and preach and they'd worshipped and done all these things together. But in John chapter 12, as they were sitting there, Mary got all kinds of stirred up about the presence of God. She got excited that the presence of God was in their midst. So here's what she did. She got up, she rose up from the crowd, and she went and found the most valuable thing that she owned. And she brought it to Jesus. The Bible says that she brought to him a pound of spikenard. It was a very costly ointment in their day. And she broke this box of ointment, and she began to anoint the feet of Jesus. And she was so profoundly moved at the presence of God, that the Bible tells us she began to weep, and she was weeping so passionately that the tears were falling on the feet of Jesus, and she wept so much and said she shed so many tears that she took her hair and began to wash his feet with her hair. Now that's pretty gross, but you've got to love somebody passionately to do something like that. And she loved him with such a passion that she began to wipe his feet with the tears that fell from her eyes, with her hair. And, and while the other disciples, watch this, while the other disciples were rejoicing, now look, they got hooked up too. Sometimes all it takes is for one Christian to say, what? God sure is good. And everybody else goes, yeah! <laughs> right? Amen. I, I, I want to say that too. I just didn't have the guts. I appreciate you stepping up. And all the other disciples start saying, woo, glory to God. All but one. A guy by the name of Judas. And here's what happened. Judas, in the middle of this worship service, stands up and he says this. He says, hey, we say a word. I know y'all are excited about Jesus being here today, but I was praying about it. Alright? I've been praying about this, and I feel like we could have sold this ointment and given the money to the poor. Sounded spiritual, didn't it? Sounded spiritual. Jesus, we could have spent that money better. Let's go, I'm the treasurer of this church. She could, have, she could have given that to the church and we could have sold it and we could have fed more poor people. He forgot that Jesus could feed the multitude with five loaves and two fish. Amen. He didn't need his garage sale, but Judas stepped up and said, we need to have a garage sale. We can sell this and give money to the poor. He sounded real spiritual. problem was the Spirit of God went within a hundred miles of what he was saying. Amen. He said, we could have sold this money and given it to the poor. And then the Bible gives us this insight. By the way, not everyone who claims to be a Christian and tries to sound spiritual is actually all that spiritual. In fact, I have found in my limited time of serving Christ over the last 20 years that the people who try their hardest to convince you how spiritual they are usually ain't all that spiritual. Now, here's what the Bible said about Judas. But if you're genuinely spiritual, you don't have to prove to me or anybody else that you're spiritual. A spiritual Christian will be identified by other Christians without you ever saying a word about how much you prayed or how much you got baptized in the Holy Ghost or how full you are in God. Amen. Hello? Judas tried to prove how spiritual he was, and here's what the Bible says. Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. That's what God said about it. God said it wasn't that Judas cared about feeding Poor people, there's nothing wrong, a lot right about feeding poor people. God's people ought to feed poor people every chance we get. Amen. He said there's nothing wrong with feeding poor people. The problem was not with what he said. It was the spirit with which he said it. It wasn't because he cared about the poor. It wasn't because he was moved by God. And it sure wasn't because he'd been praying about it. It was because he was a thief. And he wanted more money in that treasury so he could steal. He's a thief. Amen. Amen. Judas Iscariot was only concerned about the money. He was only concerned about spiritual things he didn't, or about carnal things he didn't understand spiritual things. Amen. Amen. Isn't it funny how high we, highly we esteem physical things? Right? How much stock we put 
in physical things. How much confidence we put in spiritual things. How much time we invest in physical things. I kept saying spiritual, I meant physical. You should have known that. Amen. How much time we put into physical things, outward things, carnal things, things that are going to perish and turn to dust one of these days. It's amazing how much time we spend on physical things and how little time we spend on spiritual things and we wonder Amen. why we don't have a better relationship with God than we do. Judas didn't care about spiritual things. He didn't know anything about spiritual things. He didn't understand. It was foolish to him. When Mary got up and Mary got happy and Mary started worshiping Jesus and Mary broke that pound of spider and she began to weep and cry, Judas just sat back puzzled and, and confounded because he didn't understand what was going on. Nobody kicked a field goal uh, through, through a couple posts. Uh, nobody run a uh, ball across the home play or run across the home play. Nobody had scored a goal. He didn't understand why they were so excited about Jesus just being there. Why don't get so excited about going to church? It's church. When we take up the offer to go home. Why don't get so excited about that? He didn't understand because he didn't identify with spiritual things. Number two, not only was Judas a religious hypocrite. Number two, Judas made a revealing confession about Jesus here in Matthew 26. I'm going to read it to you in just a moment. You know, the Bible says this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's scary. Because my mouth says some stupid stuff. Hello. I say some dumb things sometimes. And the Bible says it's out of the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks. So if we speak dumb, it's because we... Well, let's read some Bible. All right? <laughs> no, but, but, but Judas made a revealing confession in Matthew 26. Look, look, look at verse 20. Let's just read this, these few verses together. Matthew 26, verse 20. It says, Now when, when the evening was come, he sat down, Jesus, with his twelve disciples, and they started to eat. And here's what Jesus said. He said, I'm telling you that one of you is going to betray me. And in verse 22, the other disciples began, the Bible says they were exceedingly sorrowful. And began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goes as it was written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Jesus said, you said it. Right? Now, I never noticed anything about that. As I've read through it hundreds of times. But as I began to study this and really ponder, what was the difference between Judas and John? What was the difference between Judas and the other 11 apostles? Well, I can show you other instances, but just using this case in point. In Matthew chapter 26, the other disciples, when Jesus said, somebody is going to betray me. The other disciples began to be sorrowful. And they said, Lord, is it me? Lord, is it I? And in their native tongue, they used the word, the word curios. The word curios means supreme authority. Sovereign God in reference to Jesus. So let's put it in our modern vernacular. They said, God, am I the one? Lord, am I the one? You're the king. You know everything. And I'm the one who's going to betray Jesus. Please, you're my master. You're my God. You're my Lord. Please tell me I'm not the one that's going to betray you. All 11 disciples, except Judas, all 12 except Judas, said the same thing. And here's what Judas said. Judas said, Master, is it I? Now watch this. You've got to be real careful. Because again, some things spoken on the offset sound okay. Like, we should sell this and give it to the poor. We could have fed poor people with this. That sounds real good on the surface. But Jesus knew his heart. This statement sounds real good on the surface until you start digging into what it actually means. The other 11 said, Lord, God, Sovereign, Redeemer, am I the one? And Judas, with a rebellious spirit, said, not Lord. He said, Master or Rabbi, is it me? The word Rabbi means teacher. Which to anyone else, honestly, to anybody else in Jerusalem, to any other Jew, to refer to another Jewish man as rabbi, teacher, would be recognizing, it would be a term of notoriety, but in reference to Jesus in the context of this particular situation, it was condescending to his deity. 
All the other disciples said, you're God. You're the Lord. Lord, look at my heart. You tell me. Judah said, hey, teacher, is it me? It was a condescending statement. In other words, when he called Jesus rabbi or master, he did it in the non-affirmative clause. The other disciples made a declaration, you're God. He made the statement in the non-affirmative, and he said, Lord, is it I? Now, here's why that's so important. Sometimes we, 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 we focus too hard on little particulars, and then other times we don't focus hard enough on them. And this is one of those little particulars that we need to focus on. Because the Bible says about coming to Christ for salvation, this is what the Bible says about being saved. It says, he that comes to me has to believe that I am. Amen. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. A person doesn't get saved by believing that Jesus is a teacher or a preacher or a prophet. You get saved by believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And Judas said, I believe you're a teacher, but I'm not about to call you Lord. I believe you're a good teacher. I've heard you teach. You can, you know, you alliterate. You tell some good stories. You're a pretty good teacher. I'll give you that. But no way am I confessing Jesus is my God. But you can't be saved if you don't confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Because in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, the Bible says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You don't get saved by believing in Jesus teacher or Jesus healer. You get saved by believing in Jesus Messiah. Amen. Jesus Savior. Jesus Lord. Jesus only way, truth, and life. Not Jesus plus religion and Jesus plus my baptism and Jesus plus my good works. It's Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. And Judas never confessed Jesus as his Lord and his Savior Amen. never received him into his heart. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. You know, there's nothing redeeming. There's no redeeming power in standing up and saying, I believe in Jesus. Amen. No redeeming power in that. And that's not what that means, but here's what it does mean. When the heart is thoroughly convinced, the mouth will thoughtlessly confess. Nobody will have to get up and twist your arm and say, you get up now in front of the church, you stand in front of the church, tell them you believe in Jesus. What you get up, what you do is, is I got this card, and you just read this card off of me out loud, and, and then fill it out, and put your name there, we need your address, your email, and your phone number, and then you'll be saved. It's not being saved. Being saved is not filling out a card. Being saved is not taking a preacher's hand. Being saved is not even praying a prayer. Although you pray a prayer to get saved. It's just there is no magical prayer to pray. You know what I said when I got saved? Do you know? You don't do it. I don't do it. I just know my heart was broken. I just know I was lost. I just knew I needed Jesus. I knew that there was no other hope. I knew I'd been baptized, but I was still empty. I knew I'd joined a church, but I was still empty. I knew I tried to turn over a new leaf, but I was still empty. So I don't know what I said particularly, but I do know I said, Jesus, I need you. When the heart's thoroughly convinced, the mouth will thoughtlessly confess, nobody will have to twist your arm. My pastor did when I got saved. He said, you're going to get up in front of the church and tell everybody. I said, okay. And I did it. And I didn't want to. And I stuttered. And I was nervous. My armpits were sweating. But I did it. Amen? But that ain't me saying, I'd, been, I'd already been saved. Right? Judas never confessed Jesus as Lord. And let me give you this third and final thought. You, you got this another couple minutes for me? Let me give you this third and final thought. I pretended like I was going to change what I'm doing if you said no. <laughs> but uh, let me give you this third, and final, this third and final thought. Judas simply, now if you know the Bible, you're going to question what I'm about to say, but Judas never repented in his heart. 
The reason why I said if you know the Bible, you're going to question what I'm about to say is because the Bible says that after Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, when he realized what he had done, he went back to the high priest and he took those 30 silver coins and he threw them at their feet. And he said, I, listen, this is blood money. I, I don't know what I was doing. And he threw the change back at their feet, threw the money at their feet. And the Bible says that he repented himself. It was a problem. It says he repented himself. After the betrayal of Jesus, he repented himself. That simply means that he regretted his mistake. But he never humbled himself before God. He never confessed Jesus as Lord. He, he never was born again. You know, I have regretted a lot of things in life. I've even prayed some prayers. I remember this. I was going to church. I telling stories of myself, but here it goes. I was going to church back in 98. I was 18 years old, and uh, I'd lived a rough life, wild life, just party, just strung out, wild, been in and out of rehabs and psych wards and, and jail, never went to prison, and then I'm, not, I'm more spiritual than that, but anyway, uh, no, but just been in a lot of trouble. I got picked up one night in Washington for public intoxication. I was only 18 years old, drunk and stuff, middle of town, just... I don't know what I was going to probably call them problems. And they picked me up. And, but, but here's the deal. I started going back to church at that time. And, and I was trying to do better. Like, I was trying to stay straight in my life. And I looked at my life at 18, and I went, Dudley, you are a loser. You're going nowhere. And so I made a determination in my mind. I thought, I'm going to change some things. And I started changing some things. I started getting back in shape and started going to church with my dad and, and just started doing some things I thought was right. And, but I still party, you know, a little bit. Didn't, you know, what sport coke anymore, so I felt like I was doing pretty good. Amen. I had I arrived, I was pretty spiritual at that point. But I was drinking like a fish night, and I got picked up that night drunk, public intoxication. I was already on probation. I knew they were gonna throw the book at me. And, and so they put me in that little holding cell in, in Washington, Missouri, and I was sitting there in the jail cell, and here's how spiritual I got. I was sitting there and there was nothing but a drain in the middle of the floor. And I didn't figure out what that was for. But I was sitting there in that cell and I began to pray. And I said, God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll quit doing drugs. I was pretty spiritual, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm making a deal. Hey, I'll tell you what. I'll quit snorting and smoking and you'll get me out of it. Well, God got me out of it. He did. Miraculous situation. I won't take the time to tell you the story. But that wasn't getting saved. I think it's saved because I called on God and God saved me out of a situation. I've had people tell me, I've asked people personally, hey, do you know that you're saved? You know, if you died, you're going to heaven. Well, sure. And they begin to tell me this story about how God saved them out of a situation. Some people have told me about car wrecks they shouldn't have survived. And other people have told me about drug overdoses that they should have never lived through. And they equate that to being saved. Can I tell you something? God cares about you just like he cared about Judas. And time after time after time, God rescued him from situations that he got himself into. But that doesn't mean that he got saved. And just because God has rescued you from a bad situation doesn't mean that you've been born again. It just means that God's mercy endures forever. It just means that God loves you. God loved Judas up unto the moment and even after the fact that Judas betrayed him. Jesus still washed his feet. Jesus still loved him. Jesus would have saved him up until the moment that the rope snapped, snapped on Judas' neck and he hung himself to death. Jesus loved him and would have saved him Amen. all the way up into that moment. Judas had a false form of repentance. Repentance is not feeling bad for a stupid mistake that you made. It's not repentance. The Bible calls it repentance for God. And faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are Siamese twins when it comes to being saved. You can't separate them. You see, there has to come a point in your life when you feel bad toward God. Listen, I had hurt my family, I had hurt society, I had hurt myself, but there had to come a point when I said, God hurt you. Sorry. You made me, you've been good to me, and you've protected me. And I have offended you. I'm sorry. The Bible says that God the sorrow works repentance. Not to be repented of. Let me give you an illustration and we'll be done with this. There was a young man that was raised in a good Christian family. I'm talking about God-fearing mom and dad. Raise this boy up. Mama was a prayer warrior. Daddy was a man of the word. And this boy was raised up in this Christian home. Not a false religion, but just genuine Christian parents. But as a teenage boy, he became rebellious toward his mom and dad, toward 
anything that had to do with church just repulsed him. Any idea of going to church just he just revolted against this whole notion of serving God and, and being saved. He just he just hated any idea, any semblance of, of religion and going to church. So as soon as he was old enough to leave home, he left home and, and he joined up. He became a frequent patron. Of, of a bar, a local nightclub called the Gates of Hell. Real wholesome place. No, he did. He, he, he became a frequent patron of this place called the Gates of Hell. The Gates of Hell was so named because the owner of that nightclub, like this young man I referenced a moment ago, was also raised in a Christian family, also raised in a God-fearing home, also had a praying mama and a man of the word as a daddy. Listen, he was raised in the same environment and he had the same putrefaction and hatred toward Christianity that this other guy had. And so when he opened this nightclub, he opened it to be a slap in the face of the church. Remember Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So he named it the gates of hell to, to slap in the face any form of Christianity. And this guy was so depraved in his heart that, that he would mock church things, like churchy stuff. He'd get up and pretend like he was preaching. They're all drunk and partying and doing all sorts of ungodly things. And he'd stand up and pretend he was preaching. I'm going to open the Bible and I, I'm going to preach to you. And they'd all laugh and jeer and mock in their drunken stupor. And he would often do things like that. He'd pretend he was taking up a collection and, and singing church hymns. And they would make all sorts of fun of church things. And then one night, packed out club, packed out bar. Standing around, that bar owner stood up on the bar and he took a, a bottle of red wine and he said, rounds on the house. And they began pouring everybody wine glasses full of red wine. He said, now hold on to it. Don't drink it yet. Don't drink it. I want to make a toast. When everybody had their glass full of red wine, he, he took his glass and he held it up in the sky. And he said, here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. <laughs> Supper. We're going to have communion tonight. Everybody with their glasses raised begin to laugh and cheer and clap. And that boy that I talked about just a moment ago, a little boy named William, held that glass above his head. And as he looked up at that red wine in the glass, a voice in his heart said, You put that down, fool. Put it down. His hand began to shake. He dropped his glass and it shattered on the floor. And he grabbed his friend standing close to him and said, You've got to get me home to my mom and dad. You gotta take me home, my mom and dad. I can't do this anymore. Give me home to my parents. And they took him quickly to the house, and when they got home, his parents heard a knock at the front door. They went and opened the door, and their boy was laying there on his face at the threshold of their house, and mom and dad looked at each other and said, Oh God, they killed him. He's dead. I knew one day it was gonna take his life, and now they looked at him. His lifeless body laying there on the front porch of their house. And about that time, as they're broken and weeping and lamenting over their dead child, his head popped up and he said, Mom and Dad, I couldn't wait till you got to the door. I just got saved. He said, What? We thought you were dead. He said, No. I just wanted to get home and I wanted you to be there for it, but I couldn't wait till you got to the door. I just got down on my knees right here and I prayed and asked Jesus to save me. And I just got born again, Mom. And he wept and they hugged and just had a time. And Mom and Dad went to bed that night, but William couldn't sleep. Next morning, as his dad got up, his son handed him a piece of paper, and he said, Dad, I couldn't sleep last night. I was so excited about what Jesus did for me. He said, I was so happy I wrote a poem. Would you read it and let me know if it's any good, Dad? And his dad began to read these words. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though thou as he, wash all my sins away. <coughs> when your cow pen the words of there is a fountain the night he got saved by the grace of God. I'm telling you, when Jesus enters into the heart of a sinner, there is a difference. Amen. He'll make a change in you. And you may not be a poet and you may not be a songwriter. But there'll be something changed in your heart when you're saved. All across the room, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to just ask you a very simple question.